What's up everybody and welcome back to another video on the Sly Hooper YouTube channel. Today I'm going to be giving you part 1 of my predictions for the 2018-2019 NBA season. Before we start the video, make sure you hit the like button and also hit the subscribe button. I'd really appreciate any and all support to the channel. I tried my best not to make this a cookie cutter type of predictions video, like guessing seeding, who will win what awards, or which team will win the NBA championship, because it's obviously going to be the Golden State Warriors. Instead I'll be predicting trends, which teams will regress or progress, and projecting certain players. So without further ado, here is part one of my NBA predictions for the 2018-2019 season. My first prediction is that the Phoenix Suns will win 30 games this year. 30 games might not sound like a grand prediction of any kind, but if you have kept up with the Phoenix Suns or watched them over the last few seasons, they have been a complete mess. They have been tanking, have had poor coaching, and had a bad general manager who was fired 8 days before the season by an owner who seems to meddle with a lot of the day-to-day -day operations. Talk about a stable organization. But under that mess were some really good players that have been drafted over the last few years, headlined by Devin Booker and this year's first overall draft pick, DeAndre Ayton out of Arizona. The Suns also made a draft night trade for Mikel Bridges, who was an NBA-ready 3 and D wing out of Villanova, and they also drafted Elia Kobo, an overseas point guard who became a draft nerd favorite. So let's add that with second-year player Josh Jackson, who is an athletic 6'5 wing who turned his season around in mid-January, TJ Warren, who is a 6'7 professional scorer, free agent signee Trevor Ariza, a longtime 3 and D vet and was crucial to the Houston Rockets last season, as well as Ryan Anderson, who will help the Suns form a basic offensive identity by stretching the floor at the power forward position. Mix in the hiring of new head coach Igor Kokoskov, who has been a longtime NBA assistant, most recently under Quinn Snyder in Utah, the Suns all of a sudden have a roster and a coaching staff that makes sense. When you look at the below average NBA talent, that has been on the Suns roster the last three years to go along with the poor coaching, you'll be hard pressed to disagree with this sentiment. The preseason has already shown more competent and modern NBA offensive sets than whatever the hell Earl Watson and Jay Triano were running the last few seasons. I know Ryan Anderson was ragged on last year and was taken out of the Rockets rotation, but his skill set actually provides more spacing on the court for the Suns offense. Also, Anderson's net rating in his last two seasons was no less than 7. He was actually a positive player Player, despite his defensive flaws. The main reason he was taken out of the Rockets rotation was because he was a poor matchup for the Warriors, who are basically an anomaly anyway. The Suns also have the wing players to further shape the offensive identity and properly space the floor. The wings also provide the switchability to make up for the many warts Devin Booker has on the defensive end of the court. Just imagine a lineup with Devin Booker, Trevor Ariza, Josh Jackson, and Mikael Bridges, and DeAndre Ayton. That sounds like a pretty good modern lineup in today's NBA, even if they're young and they'll probably lose games because they are young. DeAndre Ayton is also a young big man who at 7'1 and 250 pounds forms another pillar for the franchise along with Booker. Ayton has physical tools centers usually don't have coming out of college, and while he doesn't have the instincts as an interior defender, he showed the light feet in college to be able to switch out on the perimeter. We also need to keep in mind that he was playing out of position, playing the power forward spot. He was also an efficient offensive player as well as a good passer, especially out of double teams. So far this preseason, Kokoskov has already displayed creative ways to utilize Aiden's strengths. The Suns won't be a world beater this year, but instead of being bad because of a combination of being young, poorly coached, and having too many below average players on the roster, the Suns will have the right mix of effective veterans, good young talent, and competent coaching to be at least fun, even if they don't win 40 games or make the playoffs. My second prediction is that the Bucks will finish top 7 in both pace and offensive rating. I have been long waiting to be on record about the Milwaukee Bucks, but this is finally the year the Bucks will break out. And I know as an NBA fan you have probably heard this statement the last two years, but I swear it's different this time. Want to know why it's different? Because the Bucks went from the worst coach in the NBA in Jason Kidd and an interim coach in Joe Prunty, who was arguably worse than Jason Kidd, to one of the better coaches in the NBA in Mike Budenholzer. 
We all know Bud's background as a coach, spending 17 years as an assistant with the San Antonio Spurs, and then five years as a head coach with the Atlanta Hawks, implementing a ball-moving, three-point shooting-oriented offense. And that is a welcome sight for Bucks fans who have watched Jason Kidd do everything in his power to make the offense look like a complete tire fire. Look at the last three seasons for the Milwaukee Bucks and where they ranked in pace, as well as three-point attempts. There is no way on God's green earth that a team with young and long athletes has Headlined by Giannis Atitacumpo, who is a top 10 player in the NBA, should ever have these rankings. And yet, Kidd somehow managed to do it. If you thought the offense was frustrating, the defensive rankings the last three seasons make even less sense. And this is with Giannis, who can legitimately guard 1 through 5. Jason Kidd ran this aggressive trapping defense that NBA teams quickly figured out, and he never adjusted. Every time I tuned into a Bucks game and watched the Bucks waste away, this was honestly my reaction. Thank God Budenholzer forced his way out of Atlanta to become the Bucks' new coach. Look at the job he has done with the Hawks in terms of running an offense and having a good defense. Keep in mind, the Hawks have had less talented players than the Bucks have had. Chris Middleton was recently on record saying that he and Coach Bud had a talk about which mid-range jump shots were okay to take. Which tells me what we already know. Bud understands what today's offense looks like in the NBA. More three-pointers, less of the mid-range jump shots. I look forward to Chris Middleton taking at least seven threes a game. And given his three-point percentages over his career, he should be taking that many per game. I also look forward to second-year player Sterling Brown actually getting minutes, Thon Maker hopefully being used in a condensed role to utilize his skill set. I look forward to all of it, honestly. Signing Brooke Lopez at the center spot gives the Bucks a good solid starter at that position over the patchwork that has been done at that position over the last three seasons. Giannis will finally be surrounded by four shooters who will actually be allowed to shoot threes. Giannis himself will take more threes, the ball will be hopping around the perimeter, and the pace will be more suited for the young players on the Bucks roster, especially for the Greek freak. Based on what we've seen in preseason so far, the three-point attempts, the pace, the creative ways Bud will use Giannis Giannis, Middleton, as well as Eric Bledsoe, along with running a sensible defensive scheme, will help the Bucks finally take the next step to be a 50-win team, and a serious playoff threat. My third prediction might sound like NBA sacrilege, and it had to happen at some point, but this is the year the Spurs miss the playoffs for the first time in 21 seasons. This isn't your grandpa's San Antonio Spurs anymore. It's easy to say that the Spurs won 47 games last year with basically only 9 games of a limited Kawhi Leonard, but it's not that simple. This team is drastically different. Kawhi is obviously gone. <laughs> Manu Ginobili retired, Tony Parker is now a Hornet, which is honestly just weird as hell, but the Spurs lost Kyle Anderson and Danny Green, who were two very important role players that head coach Greg Popovich relied on in the rotation. And not to pile on, but DeJounte Murray, who was expected to replace Tony Parker as the Spurs point guard of the future, tore his ACL in the preseason, and that was after Spurs rookie, and one of my favorite prospects from the 2018 draft, Lonnie Walker, tore his meniscus, and now Derek White who was one of my favorite prospects from the 2017 draft, hurt his foot, and he will be out for at least two months. So outside of DeMar DeRozan, the Spurs are thin at guard. Pau Gasol is a year older, Rudy Gay is a year older, and I have fit questions about DeRozan and LaMarcus Aldridge over the course of the season. The Spurs were 17th in offensive rating, and now their two best players occupy the same spots on the floor where they need to be the most effective. They also don't have the personnel to have a top 5 defense like they did in the 2017-18 season, thanks to all the injuries and departures I highlighted earlier. Even before the injuries, I was seriously considering having the Spurs out of the playoffs. One of the other reasons I think that is because of the improvement of the Western Conference. It was no doubt impressive that the Spurs won 47 games despite all the weird circumstances surrounding the organization, but the Spurs struggled against teams that had an above 500 record. The Spurs had a 21 and 28 record when they faced teams that had an above 500 record, while they feasted on the sub 500 teams, posting a 26 and 7 record. The Spurs machine was able to take advantage of the young teams teams that did dumb mistakes. Now it's a new season, and not only did most of the above 500 teams from last year get better, 
a lot of the below 500 teams from last year got better as well. The Dallas Mavericks added Luka Doncic and DeAndre Jordan. You might have heard about the Lakers adding that LeBron guy. The Suns got better as I highlighted earlier in the video. And the Grizzlies have retooled their roster, and now they have their two best players back and fully healthy. The wins against the bottom of the barrel teams in the Western Conference won't be so easy to come by this time around. And the Spurs only play each bottom feeder in the Eastern Conference twice a year. So sorry Spurs fans, you have the greatest coach of all time, and you had one of the best runs a sports franchise has seen, but this is the year the Spurs miss the playoffs. My fourth prediction is that Lonzo Ball will shoot 37% from three this year. Lonzo Ball was one of the more unique players to come out of college in a while, and after a promising rookie campaign, I think that playing off of LeBron James will regulate Lonzo's shooting numbers back to the days that we saw at UCLA. There is this notion that Lonzo Ball needs the ball in his hands to be successful, and I just don't agree with that at all. If you actually watched Lonzo Ball at UCLA, he wasn't a ball-dominant player. At UCLA, his best skills were cutting off the ball, utilizing his athleticism, shooting off the catch, filling the lane in transition, using his incredible court vision, and just in general being a playmaker. He was never a ball dominant player or a lead ball handler in a half court offense running pick and rolls. Lonzo also gets rid of the ball very quickly, passing the ball with less than a second in a Tom Brady-esque way. He keeps the play moving, and the ball never sticks. These are all qualities, along with his defensive promise that he showed his rookie season, that make him the perfect guard to play off of LeBron. The only thing Lonzo needs to show is that he can hit threes consistently. He tightened up his awkward shooting motion over the summer while working on his shot, and there were stretches last season, most notably in the month of December, where Lonzo shot well from the three-point line. While Lonzo shot 31% from three on the season last year, he shot 33% on catch and shoot threes, which while below league average, is not a complete disaster. Lonzo shot 41% from three in college, and it wasn't just jump shots from the college three-point line. He had no problem launching bombs from 27 feet away. I have a hard time believing that Lonzo's rookie season is indicative of the shooter that he really is. Another year of acclimating to the NBA and receiving pinpoint passes from LeBron, as well as the other playmakers on the Los Angeles Lakers, Lonzo is going to feast on more open shots, cuts to the basket, and he'll have more opportunities to be a secondary playmaker. While everybody is rightfully raving about Brandon Ingram and the steps he will make in his game playing off of LeBron, and trust me, Brandon Ingram will do that this year, I think Lonzo is equally ready to have a breakout season playing next to the King. And that just about wraps up part one of my NBA predictions for the 2018-19 season. Make sure you stay tuned for part two. Thank you for watching, and like I mentioned earlier, make sure you hit the subscribe button.